files where I actually am referenced because I had been arrested in a political demonstration. The charges were dropped because, mm. you know, I actually wasn't breaking the law. But uh, they had followed up and they had gone to where I was living and they had checked in with their local contacts. So I am actually in there and I suspect, um, you know, there, there, there's got to be more there. So there may be more on you. But my point is the FBI, I, wasn't it a couple of years ago there was a whole scandal about they had spent a million dollars or something on a new database, which was a total failure? I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know these government administrations are in many ways... Um, not as sophisticated as um, private companies, you know. And I'm not saying now that the FBI, you know, doesn't have some sophisticated technology. I, I suspect they've probably improved, but it's there could be a number of reasons why you know certain things fall through the the cracks. But it, you know, in, in the case of the folk singers, uh, uh, most of these files really get going after this informant, Harvey Matuso, shows up. Um, Matuso is, uh, he's a young guy, he's coming out of the army, he joins this group called People's Songs in the late 40s, which was supposed to be a, a national aggregation of groups popularizing, you know, workers' songs, union music, community, you know, uh, engagement, social justice. So Matuso joins this this group in New York. Pete Seeger had started it, and Matuso ends up getting alienated from the Communist Party because they're conducting this internal. It's kind of a purge. It's uh, called the White Chauvinism movement, where the Communist Party is concerned that that you know their their organization is uh, full of white chauvinist, racist, essentially. Um, it is very destructive. They ended up kicking out hundreds of people and marginalizing people. And this was all when the party itself was under attack by the U.S. government. So it's like, you know, the worst possible conditions. But Matuso, who's a white guy, he's living up in Harlem. Uh, his, his girlfriend is an African-American woman working for the Amsterdam News. But it appears he becomes a target of this white chauvinism campaign uh, because he is uh, has a job as a bill collector. And they say, well, you know, that's racist. You're preying on Puerto Rican and black people. I mean, being a bill collector, is a, it's, it's not a kind of job I would ever want. But um, Matuso had been a rising star, uh, and suddenly he's under criticism. And... And he goes to the FBI and offers his services, so he becomes an informant for them for a year. And then he's kicked out of the group altogether, and then the FBI drops him as an agent. Um, but the reason this all ties in is um, <clears throat> once he's out of the party and out of the FBI informing, he goes in front of the House Committee on Un American Activities, and he names... Pete Seeger, Lee Hayes, uh, this singer from uh, the group The Weaver. He mm -hmm. names Woody Guthrie. <clears throat> he names Josh White, the blues singer. He names everybody. Uh, and suddenly subpoenas start happening for a lot of these folk singers. You know, so uh, the FBI didn't, you know, they were following some of these people like Seeger and Guthrie, but some of these people hadn't been so pronounced on their radar. So there's a uh, it's not my view that the FBI, even then or today, is omnipotent, but they're also not stupid, um, and they they do, you know, follow, you know, the information that that's in front of them, and sometimes it just lands in their lap. And you're saying that this gentleman approached the FBI; they didn't approach him. Yeah, he. It sounds like he was really alienated. Okay. You know, and that. Uh, I mean, this is a problem. When you read about informers, it's uh, it's uh, people because the disenchanted are oftentimes the most dangerous. There's this character, uh, Morris Childs, right? The, the kind, you know, he's not a folk singer, but he's uh, he was a Daily Worker uh, editor. He had a high position in the '40s. You know, the Communist Party's newspaper was the Daily Worker. Morris Childs. Uh, he fell out on the wrong side of a, what they call a two-line struggle. 
you know, the, the party had uh, pushed out the former leader, Earl Browder, because Browder was getting a little too comfortable working with the capitalist class. I mean, you know, the, the Communist Party in the 30s and 40s, I mean, they supported the Soviet Union, but a lot of their politics were social democratic. You know, we want stronger unions, we want social security, we want unemployment, we want health care. I mean, it, it wasn't revolutionary communism. So Browder was aligned with this uh, more social democratic strain and, you know, turns in the world, uh, Stalin kind of said, no, no, we're not doing that social democracy. We need countries and, and we need communist parties in power. And Browder came under attack. This guy, Morris Childs, had been aligned with Browder. So he went out of favor. And um, he had heart problems. He was sick. Um, his wife left him because his politics were on the wrong side of this struggle. So this guy is just kind of laying up in bed, sick. You know, his friends won't talk to him anymore. He's totally alienated. Uh, the FBI got wind of it, and they went and visited him. Mm -hmm. And they paid for his health care at the Mayo Clinic, and they had long conversations. Uh, Childs is, is Jewish. So they have long conversations about the anti-Semitism prevalent, you know, in, St in Stalin's Russia um, and the purges, um, and they recruit him. And Morris Childs is in the Communist Party, and he's an FBI in informant from like 1952 until almost 1980. He ends up being Gus Hall, who was the leader of the party's bag man, going back and forth to the Soviet Union you know, picking up money to fund the Communist Party in the U.S. So um, it's not a good idea. You know, not that I'm offering anybody advice, but you know, don't don't alienate people like that. Mm. But, you know, it'll come back to haunt you. Now, now how would you describe your uh, political leanings today? Um, I'm all over the place. I mean, I'm. I guess I'm on the left. I anti-capitalist but I'm organizationally not affiliating and I think I actually have as a center principle I'm not going to affiliate with any organization. I spent a lot of my adult life being a, a hardcore political activist and uh, um, have no <clears throat> no interest in that whatsoever. I, I just feel like it, uh, it just didn't work and I, I'm not quite sure how one makes it work. But I, I, I think I'm generally, you know, on the left of things, but I'm mainly what I am is a writer and historian. So I'm very interested in the 20th century or, you know, the, the 20th century U.S. history from like the 40s into the, the long 60s, especially. And I'm very keen to look at this and get it what's there and looking at it um, maybe in a way that I was never able to or perhaps many people haven't yet been able to look at at it and, and try to understand it. I, I've found an awful lot of information in the FBI files, but there's also an abundance of information in congressional hearings where you know people are under threat of perjury so they you know generally they're either going to tell the truth or they're going to shut up so you can garner a lot from that and there's an awful lot of memoirs so there's a lot there to go back and look at it and start to get a a different picture of things you know the, this folk singer book is a pretty keen example i mean and you know some of the myths some things that you thought were solid um to paraphrase marx they melt into air when you actually look at some of the more specific details and such. But I, I'm hoping, you know, with my writing that I'm introducing people into some things that are interesting, uh, things they may not have known about, but also um, I'm keen to promote and learn myself a methodology that kind of puts aside having a preconceived notion when going into something it's you know there there is a tendency i've i've seen it's all over the place on the left and right of you know the research 
is out to prove a point. Mm. And if it doesn't prove a point, then the research stops. And, and my thing is more like, uh, well, you know, follow the research where it takes you and then, you know, try to assess it. And if it takes you to a place that makes you cringe a little bit, well, you know, that's just reality, you know. Yeah, I, mean, I, I totally yeah, agree. Ahead. I totally agree with that. That's my same philosophy as well. A qu quick question, though, before we go to a break. Now, your field of study here is unique, uh, FBI surveillance infiltration, uh, provocateurs. Uh, when you look back at your own activism, do you see now, you look back and say, oh, man, th this guy was right in front of me. He had to be an agent. Well, yeah, I did. Uh, unfortunately, I've not been able to garner evidence, like, mm. you know, looking in the file and say, aha. Uh, saying that, though, especially with the uh, Revolutionary Union, Revolutionary Communist Party, you know, we did discover some remarkable evidence of informants at the very top of this group when it was forming. I mean, it is my view that uh, that group, and probably most groups, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's kind of a currency like, well, oh, the FBI infiltrated and they destroyed this group and the right. FBI did this. And I don't really hold to that. I feel like it's, it's a dynamic and it's a relationship. You know, like the Revolutionary Union had an informant like in 72 – sitting on their secretariat. I mean, we we don't have his informant file. The FBI says they destroyed the file on this person. So we don't have 100% proof in the way of uh, some files that have been released that this guy was an informant. But we have a overwhelming evidentiary trail that this guy was, you know, giving information to the FBI. He was sitting on the secretariat of this group which composed of four people who ran the day-to-day -day operations. Um, you know, and it was through our research, through a lot of pulling on strings, uh, that we came to this conclusion. We actually discovered, I don't, I don't know if we have time for it right this second, but the FBI actually created this phony Maoist group in 1962-63, mm -hmm. composed of like about six informers who pretended they were a Maoist group operating in the pro-Soviet Communist Party as a way of disrupting it. And then they went on to use that to uh, establish bona fides for informers. This guy who got to the head of the RU claimed he was part of this, it was called the Ad Hoc Committee for a Marxist-Leninist Party. Mm. It's a totally made-up thing by the FBI. I mean, we got the memos to prove it. You know, the FBI is commending the agent who created it, Herb Stallings, saying, out of his own imagination, he created the ad hoc committee. For, uh, it was like right out of Austin Powers when he's, yeah. he's going through uh, security and saying the penis enlarger isn't his. And then there's the <laughs> book, you know, this penis enlarger is mine. You know? <laughs> anyway, Austin Powers, brilliant. Yeah. I, I always suspected the New Alliance Party was sort of a constructed group. Well, you know, I can't speak to them, I, and they're sketchy in my memory. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm going to hold my tongue and maybe go Google that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, because, you know, Lenora Filani wound up being vice presidential candidate with um, Pat Buchanan. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty awful. <laughs> How does that happen? Anyway. Yeah, well, you ahead. know, Al Sharpton was an, yeah. uh, an informant, too, for, I think, organized crime with the FBI or something. I mean, it's... It actually happened. Right? Yeah, we just did a whole show about that yesterday with Casey Gain McGowan, uh, who wrote the book of uh, the secret CIA war in Jamaica. And uh, he's convinced now as well, although we don't have a smoking gun, that Sharpton was also CIA. Uh, so, and, and the guy from the Rampart, uh, Winkler, uh, I forget his name, uh, Hink, uh, Hink, Hinkle. Wow. Okay. And he said it too. He said it years ago during the Tawana Broly thing that uh, Sharpton was CIA. But I'm going to throw you a curveball because uh, I didn't mention this to you before, but you, you, your study, your course of study here is FBI infiltration and surveillance. Have you, have you run across any foreign intelligence um, manip uh, uh, meddling in, in leftist politics? Uh, well, you know, I have, obviously, in, in reading and stuff. It's not yeah. my 
field of research, but uh, you know the big element in in the 